All right, it's uh, 3.30, and I'm wondering if I give the customary five minutes for Zoom meeting allowance for people to show up, or if we begin right away. But it is a full room, so everybody here looks like they got their lunch and showed up. So I think we'll begin. Uh, so welcome. Um, today we'll be talking about AI modeling and data, and more specifically, we're going to be talking about the top five web pitfalls when developing AI models. Uh, my name is Jacob Glodek. I run our pre-sales for Bright Data. Uh, Bright Data is a data extraction proxy uh, company. We've been in the data space and proxy web scraping space for about 10 years. Uh, I lead a team specifically who uh, helps customers implement web scraping in their technology, working on their architecture, uh, making sure that their web data pipeline is working. For uh, some of the largest companies, I think we have a little bit over 20,000 customers that are using our service. Uh, for uh, data. Now, uh, one thing I'll preface is, um, although we are talking about AI topics, I personally am not an AI expert. I am working more in the data extraction place. But what we've been seeing a lot is AI companies are using our technology, and we're seeing um, uh, customers and uh, uh, engineers who are building AI models with the data that we're providing. And we are seeing a lot of them fall into these pit, uh, pitfalls, and so we help them solve the solution. So although uh, we're not going to be getting too deep into the theory of AI, we are going to talk about where we see people get caught and what to do about it. So here's our agenda for today, uh, and it's the top five points. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about data bias. Uh, we're going to talk about insufficient data variety in your data sets. We're going to talk about a little bit of overfitting and underfitting because that one is a lot more of a theory in AI or, or ma uh, when you're managing your models, but we'll talk about wha what people are doing to solve some of the problems that they have there. Poor data quality, and uh, the last one is ignoring data drift. So with that, um, when we think about AI and why I'm speaking to you today, even though I'm not an AI expert, uh, we do focus a lot on data and gathering correct data. And so um, people have heard this a ton of times, good data in, good data out, bad data in, bad data out. And so it is very important that you're capturing the correct data and, and how you capture the data and how you validate the data is very important. So let's talk about a little bit about data bias. And this is a very popular topic these days because um, you know, I've see, everybody has tested AI models and all of a sudden the AI models start to say things or do things that are not modern, let's say. And uh, the reason for that is well, data bias is when you're using bias training data for your AI model. Bias training data is data that it does not match reality in terms of quantity and quality of the data as compared to normal life. Now. Uh, when we th think about that, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that bias is good or bad, and that's not really the place that I'm here to discuss, but what we need to do is acknowledging that bias does exist in the data set, and what data you're gathering and where you're uh, gathering that will impact that. And so one of the easiest ways to uh, see uh, bias in our data sets is by just using Google and searching for terms that historically have been maybe a certain gender or uh, maybe a group of people. So for example, if you go into your search and you search for nurse, you're going to see more female pictures than males. And nursing has been predominantly a female uh, career, but that has changed over the last 10, 15, 20 years where there's more uh, gender balance in the field. Um, I know that because uh, about 20 years ago when I was in college and uh, I worked as a nurse's aide and even then I saw diversity in the group. But of course, when I search Google for nurse, that's not representative of what it is today. Another one that probably hits a little bit closer to home in this group is programmer. Search for programmer, you're going to see more predominantly male uh, representation on the search results. Now again, this isn't necessarily that it's the wrong data. If we look at statistics and we look at historical statistics, you're going to see those types of numbers come up. But when you're building data for uh, AI models, you need to start thinking about, do I want that to be the representation of the output of the data that I want? And how do I calculate that? And how do I diversify that data to what I'm trying to show as where we want to go with this model or what we are doing with the uh, models today? So where does this data uh, bias occur when you're putting it together? Uh, these are the four places that we predominantly see breakage, and really the first one is probably the most important. Bias often originates in data collection. If you are collecting data from uh, a place where it's biased, 
it is going to be biased. There's no way around that. And so uh, making sure you have a diverse place of capturing data, and we're going to talk about how do you make that diverse, but ensuring that you're capturing diverse data will prevent things going downstream. But of course, data labeling is another one that's big. Um, and what data labeling is, is if I have a piece of data, I want, a, I want certain metadata uh, associated with it. So for me, a few years ago, when I first started uh, doing solution consulting, um, I wanted to make demos that had pictures of other people, not just myself or fake pictures. So, uh, you know, like the little tray at 7-Eleven, uh, the give a penny, take a penny, the same concept came out here where it's give a photo, take a photo so, uh, system. And so I gave a photo and I used it for demos. About five, six years later, I started to pop up on demos for other sites and, you know, BDRs and SDRs from a sales site go, hey, I saw your picture on this company. I've never heard of it. I don't do, uh, you know, gardening or anything like that. So uh, it's, I started to look into what happened there. And sure enough, it was that picture that I submitted for free uh, 10 years ago that popped up. And uh, I looked at the metadata, and it said, OK, well, we have a white male 40-year-old executive. And um, I was flattered. Uh, unfortunately, that picture was taken when I was 30. So uh, there was a disconnect from a labeling perspective. Uh, as much as I'd like to have looked you know, older when I was 15, I would have loved to look as I was 25 when I went to try to buy some uh, booze. Um, it wasn't really nice to see that when I was uh, 30, looking like I was 40. And so that data labeling, though, that model, eventually would have led to a biased approach to information because it was mislabeled. So it is important that we label that correctly. Now, model training is one that I don't know too much about, but it is a critical step. It's just that uh, when you're doing that, if you do not have the right amount of data, it's going to be really hard for you to match a data, uh, model to it, and we'll talk about that a little bit of, uh, in overfitting and underfitting. And of course, deployment. When you get the data and you put it out there, you need to test those results to see if you're getting the outputs that make logical sense. And so it, it is very important. But like I said, all of these start from that data collection. If you don't have the right data collected, if you don't have the right uh, labeling on that data, the other parts are not just not going to work. So when we think about capturing data, what is that data web pipeline that we see? So this is typically the flow that we see for customers as they're deploying. First, you need to establish access. Then you establish how you're going to collect it, what you're going to do with that data, send it to where it needs to go with data delivery, and lastly, uh, with data servicing, that's where your models are applied, your BI tools are applied, wherever it is that sits on top of the data and actually analyzes it. And so when we think about um, once you start capturing uh, or once you start thinking about getting multiple pieces of data, you might find that you're having difficulty actually using it because you have insufficient data variety. And so when we're thinking about bias and uh, data variety, that comes into play. So what is insufficient data variety? AI models require diverse data to understand different scenarios and variations. If the training data is too homogenous or lacks variety, the model might not perform well in real-world diverse conditions. So we have that nice picture, which probably everyone has seen at one point or another on the internet. Nice little row of seven or eight males in their age of mid-20s. Again, I'm labeling, and I could mislabel them. They could be 15, who knows? Um, at a baseball game, uh, all enjoying it. Uh, I'm pretty sure they probably all have the same barber, grew up in the same town. And so if I went to this group of individuals and I started to ask them questions, whatever it is, I would get one, pretty much a non-diverse group of viewpoints. And so what we fall into a lot is, uh, especially if I'm a member of that group and I'm looking at that data set, it'll look, hey, this looks correct to me. But in fact, all of these people probably had a very similar experience in the back, and so their data, if I was gathering from them, wouldn't be diverse. And so if I try to run something, uh, a, a analysis on this, and a person who doesn't fit that mold would come in, all of a sudden the model would get confused. I wouldn't know what to do with it. And so for me to address that, what I need to do is I need to gather data from different sources, different groups, uh, different regions, for example. And so this is where you need to, when you're doing data gathering, you need to ch find the right proxy network so that you can address uh, and capture data from different locations. And of course, building a good a crawler to capture that data. So proxy network. Probably everybody in the room knows what it is. Um, in layman's terms, a person who makes a call on behalf of another individual from another location. 
And so going back to that picture earlier, how do I address that uh, diversity is by making calls and making uh, scraping uh, attempts at different places in the world, and that's very important. And so when you're looking for a proxy network to use for your scraping needs, you want to make sure that it's a strong proxy network, and there's really two things that I would want you to look out for. One is making sure that the proxy network is very large. So like, for example, at uh, Bright Data, we have over 72 million I IPs globally. If the subset is too small, it's going to be very hard for you to target specific regions. Now, for us, majority of those IPs, well, I won't say majority, but a large number of those IPs are in the US. We can actually tailor by neighborhood uh, for where you're targeting. And so that gives, uh, allows me to understand a lot better what is uh, that experience for those users versus a user in a different part of the country or in a different country in a different part of the world. And so an example of using proxies and the results that you're going to get is just by going to Amazon best-selling toys. If I go to a US site, you'll see that I have four diff uh, eight different options, Uno there, Play-Doh, Tapple. But if I go to Europe, I have different ones that are there, different games, different things that they play. And so if I'm building a data model and I want to understand and I want to target so it's more generalized, if I was only capturing America, I would, I would be looking at that only. But if I captured also Europe, now I can start understanding the difference between the two. And this is also where labeling comes into play. For example, Play-Doh here in Europe is number three. Play-Doh in America is uh, number five. They are also different packaging, though that could be regional. But you need to label that so that you know the weight and the understanding of that. And proper labeling will make a difference in your model. Now, this gives you the proxy piece. But the next piece is crawling capability. So probably a lot of people in this room have built crawlers before. Um, and of course, once you start building it and you start running it, you start seeing cool little screens like, oh, hey, what's that? Or that one. Or that one. And then all of a sudden, it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and you're like, man, I can't get this scrape done because I can't get past those lockers. And the reality is, um, there are two different sets of skills, writing a scraping tool and actually going uh, and unlocking sites or bypassing the locks that are there are two different sets of skills. And so when you're doing unlocking, you got to look out for these types uh, of uh, pieces, right? Browser fingerprints are one of the ways that if you can establish a proper browser fingerprint and you can really mimic an, an individual user, you can get past that. Uh, CAPTCHA solving, like we saw in there. Retry logic. If you retry too quickly, it might fail because they're going to have anti-bot technology that captured that. At the same uh, measure is how do I manage all of my proxies? And so what we have seen uh, for us is when uh, we started out as a company, we were only a proxy company. And so a lot of engineers would go out and they would use us for targeting different sites, but then anti-bot technology started coming up. And then each of those teams would spin up uh, an individual team that would manage that or hire an independent person. And so it was a large cost for those organizations. And what we found is if we can centralize that and we can sell you web unlocking technology, that's going to make you faster and, and more efficient. And so that's where we launched it. So, uh, and it's not just us as Bright Data. Any other proxy vendor, most of the proxy vendors have some, uh, something similar to this. So as you're picking those out, this does help you out. And so what we're seeing in businesses is a uh, 10 years ago, you would see in-house development for all of this. But now what we're seeing is people are starting to use the tools to speed themselves up. And rather than having a whole team for web unlocking technology, they have a team for or dedicated for scraping, but they also at, at that point are in this hybrid model where they're using the tools that are developed to make it faster for them. Okay? And there's going to be one more little step here that I talk about a little bit later that could be impacting you, but we are seeing uh, a lot of companies, so we'll go to that. But of course, you now have built your, uh, your um, scraper. You show it to your boss. You're like, hey, I bypassed all of this technology. Boss goes, that's excellent. Now I need you to do 100 more sites by tomorrow. Right? No good deed goes unpunished. And so, of course, you get back to your office and you're like, God damn it, I now have to spend my whole day building another 100 scrapers. And now you've got to start thinking about not only am I building it at scale, I also have to support that from an infrastructure uh, perspective. And so that's now a lot more. You need to start asking uh, you know, infrastructure teams and resources teams to make sure you have that allocated. And so as you're building that out, 
these are just things to consider as you're doing it. Now, um, I, do, I give this slide a lot when I'm talking to people on a build versus buy conversation, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be buying the tools or not, but it is something to keep in consideration because there's a lot of resources that are required for you to be successful on an enterprise scaling operation. And so not only do you have to have sca scraping expertise, you also need to know how to manage schemas. You have to also know how to manage the database that it's going to go into. You need to also be able to manage the proxy servers, do the blocking. And so what we, have, uh, what we have been doing, and what our competitors as, as well have been doing, is we have been building tools to make each one of these easier for you so that you don't have to manage everything. And if you need to be able to scrape on the fly or ad hoc, just need something done, we have built tools to make that easier for you. So specifically, for scraping development, we've built two tools. One is our Web Scraper IDE. Now currently, it is a JavaScript scraping solution, uh, but I wouldn't be bringing this up if there wasn't a Python piece to it. We are going to be launching this with Python available here shortly. But what that allows you to do is to write your interaction code directly into an IDE that we host and then we run for you. And so that makes it uh, where you don't have to have an infrastructure, you don't have to do anything like that, you just write the code of the sites that you want scraped, either trigger it from a scheduled job or trigger it through an API and it'll run. We have found that up, it has reduced dev time by 75%. I wouldn't call it necessarily dev time, but delivery time, right? From the time when a, when a person makes a request and says, I need to scrape X time, how fast do we get that? We've seen that move a lot faster. And so really how it works is very simple. On the left-hand side, you have your ID, you write the code in there. It then goes in and it attempts to crawl and scrape. And it, at any point in there, we've bundled in our anti-blocking uh, anti, uh, technology. And so that unblocking technology will unlock the site, gather the information you want, and then deliver it to any one of your means on the right-hand side. So whether that be to an S3 bucket or a GCP or, well, some people still like to get CSVs via email. Those are all available there as well. And so this is just a visual uh, of what you're seeing. On the left-hand side is the ID. It runs, and then you receive a file like that on the right side. And then what we've done as well is uh, we've seen from a lot of people who've already written code in um, uh, scraping automation libraries like Playwright, Selenium, or Puppeteer. And then they said, hey, I've already spent my time writing this. Can you just run it? And so we launched our scraping browser that does the same thing like the IDE, but allows you to host the code. And then what you're doing is you're basically sending us the Puppeteer script to us or any of the other uh, libraries. And then we run it for you, and we give you the results. This has become very popular for a lot of our customers because um, they've already put in the resources. They understand how to do that. They just don't want to manage the infrastructure of your headless uh, browsers, right? Um, that required a whole other team, a lot more headaches. And so what they're doing here is that they write the script, they press enter, and they go. Or sometimes they'll try it on their infrastructure. Somebody forgot to update something. And rather than doing that, they just jump over here and run it over here. So this is something that's available. And uh, so when we think about the key features of why we've done this is scale, allowing you to scale your operation without having to waste uh, time and money on resources, uh, compatible with a lot of APIs and languages that you're using, uh, unlocking capabilities built into it so you don't have to do anything special, you just write the code in there, and of course, immediately accessible. We always keep our stuff up to date so you're able to do it right away. So you went through, you wrote the script, now it's running. Uh, but now you're seeing some weird things with the model, and so that's where overfitting and underfitting comes into play. Um, this is a very generalized uh, explanation of what overfitting and underfitting is, and um, like I said, there's probably a lot of other people from the AI space that are going to explain this, well, after a few beers in a very long way, but um, overfitting occurs when a model is too complex and learns to fit a, a training data so closely that it fails to generalize new data. Underfitting happens when the model is too simple to capture the underlying patterns. What that basically translates to is you either have too much data that is generalized, that is too similar, or you don't have enough data. And in both cases, you can solve this by capturing data, but you need to have specific data. And so like for underfitting, for example, um, the three common ways to address that, increasing training time, using more data, or picking a different model. Of course, picking a different model is one way to do that, though it's also difficult to pick the right model if you already have the right model. 
Uh, if we think about increasing training time, that could work, but in the end, you're still training off of a bad set of data, and so really the best thing to do is to increase the data and picking correct data. Now, overfitting, a little bit harder to solve, uh, because unlike underfitting, you probably have a lot of data, you just don't have enough of a diverse data so that your model actually works. It starts becoming very strict, and it starts becoming like those guys that are at the baseball game, and they don't understand other concepts from it. And so the only way to fix that is also by expanding that uh, data piece. And so what we have found is a lot of this um, data modeling is done by uh, data architects, and they're not necessarily scraping experts. And so what we have found is outside of the developers that are in this room, those, uh, those uh, scientists are looking and saying, hey, can I get the data myself without having to bug you? And so what we found is that now, not only are we having a hybrid approach, we're seeing people come to us and ask us to be a data as a service provider. And so rather than just saying, uh, hey, I have a team that has developers, maybe they're swamped, maybe you guys are so busy, or maybe it's a site that's too complicated. We're seeing people come to us and ask us for the data as an end result so that they don't have to manage anything. And so with that, our company has launched a data set marketplace and a custom data set. And for the people in this room, I know for you, you're probably not going to be using this as much, but I think that this is something that you can offer to the uh, team members or people who are asking for data in your organization, where you might look at it and go, that, it's just easier. Why don't you just go buy the data set? I don't want to play with it because it's not something that's specific to our business. It's not something that's proprietary. It'll just be easier to offload. And so data set marketplaces, for example, um, there are sites that we have taken, major sites that we have taken, and we've just made it easier for people to get because we pre-scrape them, and then we just allow you to filter it. And so, for example, um, we have advanced filters, so you can do it by uh, region. So, like, for example, if I wanted to go to Amazon and, and I only want to target per perfumes, I can do that filter on there and then just download that sample data set, all without coding. And so if you take the top sites uh, and what we have in the marketplace, uh, my suggestion is to go through that first because then you don't have to build the scrapers for it. You can just say, hey, do that. I have actually more important things to do. And so you can see here like popular data sets. What do we actually scrape? LinkedIn, very popular. Amazon, eBay, Target, Walmart. Uh, these are all very popular places and we have a lot more. So that makes it easier. These ones are the pre-built ones. Sometimes you'll have people to come to you and say, hey, I want to scrape the site, and maybe you don't have the time or the resources to do that. We also do the same thing from a custom data set perspective. The only difference between custom data set and marketplace is that there's a concept of validation on custom data sets, and that's because marketplace, we understand the data, so we're able to provide that, but on custom data sets, you're just giving me a site that you want scraped. I don't actually understand the rules or how it's supposed to be structured, so we do want some input from you on that. Custom data sets features are pretty much the same. Uh, and so in the end, what you're doing is now you're getting a lot of the data, whether it be from scraping methods that you've put together, that you've, uh, you've um, expanded and done that, or you've bought pre-built uh, pre uh, custom data sets. But what you're now seeing is, hey, the model is not giving me what I want. And what we're finding that is, hey, maybe you don't have good data. You have data a lot of data, but do you have the right data and is it labeled and is it done correctly? And so poor data uh, quality is when the training data is full of errors, inconsistencies, or poorly labeled. The AI model will likely inherit these flaws, naturally, and ensuring high data quality is essential for developing reliable and accurate models. So how do you address that? And that's where you build validations into your data while you're scraping. So before it goes into your AI model, you need to validate that data before. And so these are nine validations that I have, and uh, really, if I take anything from this uh, presentation, I probably would be taking this as one of the most important parts is, how do I approach the data so that I know I'm getting the right pieces of data? So for example, uniqueness. Uniqueness can apply, to, uh, and, and again, you, when, the data, when you understand the data, you're gonna understand which one of these validation checks makes sense. But uniqueness, for example, if I'm selling T-shirts, T-shirts sizes are pretty generic, right? You're gonna have small, large, medium, maybe extra small, extra large, whatever it is. But you're only gonna have about 10, 15 sizes that you have. So when you look for uniqueness in that field, if you're capturing sizes of shirts, 
you don't need it to be unique. It can be a low percentage of uniqueness, right? I only need 10% unique, 15% unique, because that's how much I have. But on the other hand, if I'm capturing that same field as a um, ASIN or a SKU, then I expect the percentage to be much higher in uniqueness. Or something like persistence validations. What did I get previously for this field? What was the score for that field? Am I getting it in the vicinity? Or minimum and maximum records thresholds. This one comes up a lot for us because people go, hey, I went to a site, there's a thousand jobs. Okay, but once you dig into it and then you go by pagination or something, there's really only 500 jobs. And so understanding what that record threshold is is something that will help you make sure that the system is running correctly. And again, all of these should be flags, either red or yellow flags, and you react to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that failing validation means it's a bad data set. It just being aware of when it's a good or bad data set is what's key here, and, uh, and uh, examining it. And the reason why these are really big is because websites change all the time. You write your crawler, you run it, and it's going good. Three days later, four days later, five days later, all of a sudden, the site changes. And if you don't have these validations in place, you're going to have a problem because that site's going to change, your bad data is going to go in, and now your AI model is being fed incorrect data. And so this has to happen before you're delivering the data to, uh, to your systems. And then, of course, that delivery is also very important. B uh, a lot, you know, ETL tools sometimes will mess up. So it is very important that you have a proper delivery. And I'll say this, um, any of uh, the scraping and data uh, systems out there, uh, whether it be Bright Data or any of our competitors, uh, we're pretty good at this. So this is where if you are planning to build on your own, I would try to uh, you know, talk you out of that because this is built in with a, a way to drop it in directly into the um, uh, cloud storage facilities that you need it to. But if you have to build it, this is a very critical part to make sure that the data goes into where it needs to go. And so the last pitfall that we'll talk about here is data drift. And this one um, has been really popular lately because, uh, well, I'll talk about it later, but it's definitely not a car drifting by. That's uh, not it. Uh, what data drift is, is over time, the real world data that an AI model encounters may change or drift from the data that it was trained on. This can happen due to evolving trends, behaviors, or environments. Failing to monitor and adapt to these changes can render an AI model less effective. Data drift is not necessarily bad. It is just something that you have to be aware of. And that comes into, like, for example, this season, we're all going to wear red shirts. Next season, we all decide to wear blue shirts. So now all of a sudden, the AI model will start telling you that blue shirts are good and red shirts are bad. They're all last seasons. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Not really. But it is something that can this be manipulated negatively where people are inputting da data that's drifting the data into the wrong direction? They can. And so monitoring that data drift and comparing it to other results is very important. And you've probably seen this. Uh, online, uh, Paul Graham, who's a, a VC over at uh, Y Combinator, um, recently posted about the word delve. And uh, I'm a native English speaker, um, so delve is not really something that I use a lot, and neither is Paul. And so Paul said, well, if it's not there, then somebody's manipulating the data engine. And so he believed that there was a data drift in the wrong direction. And I'll say that we can probably do some analysis uh, what, we, uh, what people are saying is non-native speakers who learn the language properly or more uh, learn it by the book might use words like delve and other words in their language. And so if they've done more publishing or putting information, that'll go through. So I don't think Paul's necessarily right. But it is something that he noticed on that uh, shifting. And so that just sparks a topic of conversation for you. As you're building that AI model, talking about where that drift goes, and if it's an acceptable drift, cool, keep going. And if it's not an acceptable drift, what's missing? Why am I getting the wrong data? What is the source of data? How is it labeled? Where it's going? It's prompting that conversation, and then at that point you can adjust and get data from other places. So I know I've said this several times today, uh, the solution for everything is more data. Um, true, it is. But we also have to look at what data it is. So not only uh, are we talking about getting a lot of data, we're talking about getting that quality data, right? We talked about bias, and when we think about bias, you need to diversify the data and that you're getting it. 
when you're getting that data, making sure that the data is validated correctly, making sure your infrastructure is correct. And then uh, lastly here, use the tools that are available. Now, um, bright data and scraping and proxies, I would say that it was a gray area in the industry for a long time. Uh, people didn't know if it was legal or not legal. And uh, what happened here in the last, actually, month, uh, there was two court cases that we were a part of, one against Meta and one against uh, X or Twitter, where both of those companies were saying, hey, you shouldn't be able to scrape publicly accessible data. And we fought them on that because we do believe that publicly accessible data, data that doesn't require an, a login, should be available to be scraped. And we won both of those cases. So there is now laws that are coming into play that allow people to start uh, that actually legally called out by law that you're allowed to scrape data that's publicly accessible. And so what's happening now is companies like ourselves and our competitors are now being brought into, I won't call it legitimacy, but it is something that people are now recognizing and saying, hey, I can scrape data. This is how I can do it. Not only do I have to go into some alleyway somewhere and pay money and somebody gives me a USB stick with some uh, you know, data, I can actually legitimately go to a business and go buy it. And so that is something that I see a, ch a change in the industry and a more positive outlook. But these are just a you know, couple of uh, pitfalls. Again, um, I'm not the AI expert. I'm just uh, you know, seeing that as people are trying to get the data, I want to make that easier for you. And uh, we as Bright Data want to make that easier for you. And uh, I believe we have. So if there's any questions, um, again, my name is Jacob. Uh, I run pre-sales. We do have a booth downstairs, so please come visit us. Uh, but happy to answer any questions up here if you guys have any. So thank you for coming. Yes. Right. So, uh, yes. There's a question about um, legality of uh, data scraping in the U.S. versus Europe, especially with um, uh, PII and uh, how that applies to GDPR in, in Europe. Um, I think publicly accessible data, if it's publicly on a site, it is allowed to be scraped. GDPR actually implies more of storing of that data and doing things with it. So back to that validation piece. What I have found a lot of people to do is they'll scrape the data, but during validation, they'll remove all the PII. So that before it goes into a system, there's no PII in there. So um, being that we're more on the technology of the scraping side, the legality of that is going to be really up to that business. I have seen some weird things from a GDPR perspective with companies and how they treat data. So uh, it is up to the interpretation of that legal officer. But most oftenly, I see uh, during the validation steps, they remove PII or ha they have some sort of GDPR scraping before it goes into their AI model. So the scraping piece is OK, but it's what do you do with the data? Don't put it into the system that's going to actually process it. Yes. Yeah, continuing, I guess, with the theme of legality. So I was wondering about, I guess, the um, getting around all those blockers to mm -hmm. you know, select the cars and yada yada, whatever mm -hmm. Google does. So what's the legality around that? Is that something that just exists for companies to try to stop people from getting data? Or like when I go around that with a machine, am I breaking you know, some law or something? So that was addressed directly in the lawsuit. So the judge basically said, it is your responsibility as a company, when he was talking to Twitter, uh, or, or Meta in both cases, to put on blockers. If you want to or not, that is your call. But the fact that the site is accessible publicly says that you're allowed to scrape. So I think we're going to play the cat and mouse game with the companies who are saying, I want to block that. But there is no, uh, there's nothing wrong with us bypassing uh, that site. Because if I took a, if 99% of the si times, and this is how we test the sites, if I take the URL and I put an incognito on my local computer and I click Enter, do I need to log in? Do I need to accept any terms of service? Do I need to do anything special? As long as I'm not doing that, to me, I can scrape it. And then if occasionally you give me a pop-up, and I go around the pop-up, that doesn't break any rules, because I'm not really accepting terms or anything like that. Now, uh, one more thing I'm not is a lawyer, so... Um, 
I'm just interpreting it the way that I have seen it, yes. Um, I, I really appreciated the um, treatment of, of validation because, because I, I can, yeah, I can validate that it's a, it's a project. It can sometimes be a project on its own mm -hmm. to, to um, set up a proper validation. Um, to that end, I was also, I was wondering if uh, Bright Data participates in or publishes any open benchmarks that you could use a priori before, um, you know, choosing Bright Data to, to be able to see the quality on a, on a, a large data set. Um, you know, an open data set. So on the um, marketplace data sets, uh, we offer free samples to individuals. Uh, in our sales cycles, we typically allow people to check out other places and compare themselves. Um, it's really hard to give that benchmark because sites are continuously changing. Um, every month, there's going to be one or two sites that are a pain in the ass to me. Uh, currently, there's a site called Shopee that is very difficult to scrape. They have a lot of blockers that are coming into it. If anybody is sh scraping that, I, I feel sorry that you're in that place because I know the pain of that. But we'll solve that, and the next month it'll be a different one. And these things impact all of the players uh, in this space, including individuals who are scraping along with companies. So it's really hard to benchmark what is good because it continuously changes. But that is why, like most of the sites, including ourselves, we offer you samples from the site. Check it test it and keep going, but at, uh, at the same time, could a new anti-bot technology come out? It can, and it'll take us a little bit to get around that to get through. Yes? Um, I have two questions. The first one is, in your... Hold on one second, let me get you that, yeah. Yeah, in deck, you mentioned about the gatekeeper of the data quality, mm -hmm. and you listed data st um, stability. Could you elaborate on that? That's my first question. So when we think about data stability is, am I consistently getting a, um, a structure of the schema every single time? So when you receive that schema, uh, when you receive a page, um, you might not get the right results in the same uh, object on the page. And so at that point, you would need to build out some extra logic or change it. So uh, data stability is, is still on the result of the uh, scrape. Um, it, this one individually wouldn't be a validation check. It's more of a holistic validation check, but it is something that says, am I, am I uh, for example, uh, type verification? Am I getting uh, a integer every single time or am I getting a string every single time? And when it changes, that, that's not a stable data. And what's the time range you use? Because maybe every once in a while, like the website data, you're gonna change, right? So you should run these every time you run your job. You should run a validation check on it every single time. And then uh, persistence, you should look at. And again, it, some of these are going to be yellow flags. They're not going to be red flags. And yellow flags is there for you to just check it. Um, because um, even if you check like 10% of the records and you say, OK, I'm seeing that, you can change your validation rules. We see this all the time where people will set a validation rule. They're going to run their job. And then a month later, something changes on the site. They go back and go, oh, I can't get. 50% uniqueness, I need to drop that or change it. Then they adjust the other ones to make sure that they're doing it. But these checks are run every single time a job goes through. I see. Um, my second question is, I want to know that how does Bright Data address the data drift issue in the AI model for your client? Because data drifting is, you can try all the ABCD, the, mm -hmm. the things you try here, but you can only see it after the model is deployed, is running for a while, right? When Correct. it happens, it happens. It's after the fact. Correct. And, and, and you know, like uh, I think one of the earlier slides I said, um, you know, in the order of things that are most important, uh, data collection is the most important part because if you co collect incorrect data, you're going to cause data drift potentially. So we don't directly do that. Uh, we don't directly monitor the data drift because that's already what the model is using, right? Our data is sold not only to AI; it is sold to people who just do, uh, for example, marketing, and they want to get grab data. So we don't actually uh, interpret the data after the fact. But what we can do is making sure that you will know where that data came from, labeled correctly, so that you can go back and address whatever the data drift is. So we won't be able to figure out what that data drift is. We just will be able to help you fix wherever you're gathering the incorrect data that's causing the drift. If, if it's an unacceptable drift, like I said, like moving from red shirts to blue shirts might be an acceptable drift because it's a seasonal drift. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Well, thank you again, everyone. Um, and uh, come check out our booth. We have these lightsabers, other things. It's a good place to go. Thank you.